Hey everybody, welcome back to Author Journey. My name is CJ Hanaya and today I am here with Jeanette Rollison and I am so excited because I love her. <laughs> She's one of my most favorite authors and I have followed her since I was a teenager uh, mm -hmm. and then I just have been fangirling ever since because now I'm a part of the same um, writing organization, didn't realize it at the time. So when I went to um, American Night Writers Association conference and saw her there and she was teaching all of these amazing workshops, I just about died. Uh, <laughs> so I'm really excited that she's here. Thank you so much for being here, Jeanette. Thank you for having me. You betcha. And I'm just going to introduce you to everyone here, read your awesome, amazing bio so that they can know who you are a little more. So... Jeanette Rollison is old. Don't ask how old because it isn't polite. Let's just say she's older than she'd like to be and leave it at that. Jeanette lives in Chandler, Arizona with her husband, five children, and enough cats to classify her as an eccentric cat lady. She did not do this on purpose. The cats, that is. She had the children on purpose. Every single one of the felines showed up on its own and refuses to leave. Not even the family's fearless little Westie dog can drive them off. Since Jeanette has five children and deadlines to write books, she doesn't have much time left over for hobbies. But since this is the internet and you can't actually check up to see if anything on this site is true, let's just say she enjoys dancing, scuba diving, horseback riding, and long talks with Orlando Bloom. Well, I never said he answers back. And I love Orlando Bloom, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good, good choice. Yeah. Very good choice. Yeah. Well, do you, do you so, find on those author bios, because they, they want you to say interesting stuff about yourself and you think, no, I've spent my whole life writing. There's Yes, yes. It. Or I've spent at least a decade birthing children, which, yeah. I mean, there are some horror stories to share in that, but nothing <laughs> appropriate for a bio. So <laughs> That's what we yeah. should do, labor stories on all of our bios. <laughs> oh, 18 gosh. hours in her last labor. The oh, my girl didn't work. Yeah, that's a, that would be a good marketing strategy yeah. for sure. At least it would get the females being like, oh, I can so relate. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I asked Jeanette to come on the show because a lot of you have had questions about dialogue, and she is the queen of it. I've already sat through some two awesome workshops that she's done, one about dialogue rules and then another about just humor. And so we're going to go into rules on dialogue with Jeanette. So Jeanette, I'm going to pull up this PowerPoint presentation and then I'm just going to turn the time over to you and you can school us in all things dialogue. We can learn from your wisdom. Yes, wisdom, wisdom. Um, okay, so the, the presentation I sent you, I, I feel like I should always explain that there's a just a page with a bunch of my books on it. I have that up at conferences as proof that I'm a real author and, <laughs> and have actually written dialogue at some point. Yes. In my life. Well, and I need to point out that you you not only write under your name, Jeanette Rollison, but you also write under the pen name C.J. Hill. Do you kind of want to explain why you did that? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I, I started as Jeanette Rollison and I wrote all these girl books and they were pink and had fairies on them and sparkly things. And then when I wrote the Slayer series, it had... Um, a girl main character, but a couple of boy main characters too. And there was dragons and fighting and, you know, that sort of thing, weapons. Um, and so the publishers didn't think that boys would read it and they wanted to tap into that boy market. So for all of my books that also have boy main characters, I'm CJ Hill and they put fire and blackness on my covers because apparently that's what boys like reading. That's what dudes like to watch, yeah. huh? Yeah. <laughs> Girls with Weapons, that was one cover. So, so yeah, that's my CJ persona, who's apparently a lot more interesting than I am in real life. You know? Oh, well, I love so many of these, but I especially love the Slayer series. That's one that I definitely recommend. It is so okay. good. <laughs> Thank love you. It. You are welcome. Okay, so the first thing I always tell people, and this is true for dialogue, but it's also true for really just about any writing rules that you'll learn about, is... At first, just just write the scene and don't worry about all the rules. If you are worrying about, you know, even remembering all the rules, let alone breaking them, you'll just give yourself writer's block. So just write it, and then when you come back in that magical revision process that, um, at least for me, takes as much time as um, 
the writing did, that's when you're looking at the rules and, and fixing stuff. So the first rule right. is just write it. Um, next rule, um, you have to re realize that dialogue is not actually the way people talk, but it just needs to sound natural. If you ever transcribe a real conversation, you find that uh, people use run-on sentences and they use the words um and uh and like and, and you know, all those things that make you sound a little less intelligent. Um, you want <laughs> That's to, me. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's it's sad but true. I um I had one interview for a newspaper where the reporter just you know she asked me the questions and then transcribed everything I said and it was the worst interview ever because you know yeah you just sound like an idiot. Um, <laughs> so so yeah it, your your characters are going to talk better than real dialogue. They're going to um. It, um cut all of the run-on sentences and and saying things more than once. Um, also, in, in real life, we have a lot of chit-chat. We say hello and how are you doing and what have you been up to and all that sort of small talk. And your characters don't have the time to do that. So they're going to be a lot more direct and to the point. Um, one of the worst sins that I see with dialogue that will get you rejected right away is uh, overloading your your dialogue with backstory. What happens is writers, they want to get some point across to the readers, so they think, oh, well, I'll just have the characters say it. Um, and that only works if the characters would really actually be talking about that subject. So, yeah, for example, you, you don't want to say things that both characters know. Um, well, we can invite your brother to our party. He's backpacking across the mountains of Bolivia and won't be back until next month. Okay, if this is somebody's brother, they probably know where he is and when he'll be back. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, also, and I see this a lot in science fiction and fantasy, any sentence that begins with, as you know, you know, as you know, here on the planet of, you know, whatever, the firstborn child must go serve the king. Well, as you know, if there are twins born, then, you know, yeah, yeah. it just, it doesn't sound right. Um, right, because if they know, then there's no point right. in saying it to them. <laughs> right. Got it. There are a few times that we say that. So, for example, this sentence, while I'm off to my job as an engineer at Orbital Sciences Corporation where I work as a project manager. So, if you were writing this and you wanted to have the, um, the, the characters get this across, what would be a more natural way of doing it? Well, um, you, could, you could tweak the dialogue so it sounds more natural. So, this example. Guy walked down the stairs straightening his tie. Well, don't you look nice, Jeanette said. What's the occasion? He tugged the tie tight. A meeting with a four-star. I get to explain why the rocket's behind schedule. Sounds fun. Just one more perk of working for Orbital. The, the second and probably easier way to do it is to put the information in the internal thought of the main character. So, for example, uh, you could write it this way. Guy walked down the stairs and gave his wife a kiss. She brushed away a piece of lint on his suit. Good luck with your meeting. Thanks, he said. He'd been dealing with generals ever since he became a project manager at Orbital Sciences, but telling them bad news never got easier. Um, so there, it's just sort of a natural, um, you know, the character is thinking about this, and so you just put it in their internal thought. And the caveat to that is that it really has to be something that they would naturally be thinking about in the scene. Um, I couldn't just insert in there... Um, and five years ago, his wayward son had disappeared with a gang of, you know, bikers or something. Because that wouldn't be a normal, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so if I was going to it would be jarring. Put, it would yes. kind of pull you out of the story yeah. a little bit. Yeah. It would be very obvious, oh, here's the, the author stepping in to give information. And you don't want that. You want it to feel like the character is telling the story. So if I wanted to put information about the son, I would have to have something in the story reminding the character of their son. So, okay, moving right along. Number three, use dialogue to reveal characterization. I think um, J.K. Rowling did this really well with the Harry Potter series um, because Hagrid didn't sound like Harry and Harry didn't sound like Hermione and, you know, Snape and Dumbledore sounded different than the kids. Um, sometimes as authors, all of the characters kind of talk in our voice and we need to... to uh, get away from that when we can. Um, that doesn't mean that, you know, you have to have one character who talks like a pirate and another one like Queen Elizabeth. Um, you know, 
but uh, just more subtle little things. Um, I found uh, for me, it's it's hard for me to write dialogue sometimes as a man um, because I'm a woman and women have different ways of talking than men do. Men are usually a lot more succinct. Uh, so what I try and do for when I have books where I have a character who's a guy, um, I will have one of my guy writer friends read it over and give me notes. And there's, you know, some places where they'll say like, no, the, the guy wouldn't say this or, yeah, this sounds lame or, um, you know, so it's really helpful if you have people in your life that they can help you with those different voices. I would imagine that you would probably need someone who also is kind of aware of like the subject matter that you're discussing too. Like would right. that person say that in that situation about that thing? Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Interesting. And, and that is, that is like, what do your characters know? Because sometimes you know more than they do and you still have to have it like how they would describe something. Or sometimes they know way more than you do and you have to go study it and say yeah. like, okay, how would they be talking about this? <laughs> Right. Uh, and then, you know, of course, uh, you, I, I'm fairly old now. Don't ask. It's not like. Um, <laughs> but so I'll, you know, I'll be writing kids, teenagers, and every once in a while I use a word that people will tell my beta, beta readers will say like, oh, teenagers don't say that word anymore. Um, the last one was the word slinky. Uh -huh. um, I had a <laughs> characters wearing something slinky and my beta readers were like, no, I don't think teenagers use that word anymore. And I was really sad about that because I like that word and I feel like, you know, uh, I should have a say in whether <laughs> words are just taken whether out. Whether something's of. outdated or not. Yes, yes. Like, <laughs> or, or at least someone should tell me there should every year be a memo sent around of these, are, these words are no longer said by cool people, you know. <laughs> yeah. I'd never get that cool list, though. I think you have to be a cool person to get on the cool list. Yeah, that's true. Maybe there really the... is that list, and we're just not... We're just not a part we're of just it. Not doing it. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, I guess by the time your mother's saying it, it's no longer cool it's is no the rule of thumb. That's a valid point. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, to help people with this, I sometimes have them do an exercise where um, I say, okay, take the main character that you're working with on your book right now and um, pretend that uh, your character is being interviewed by a detective in a murder mystery. This may be a surprise to your character if they started out in a romance, uh, but now they're being called into question uh, by a detective. And he's come to their home and he tells them, there was a Siamese cat fur found at the scene of the crime, but the victim didn't have a cat. The detective then notices that the character has a cat toy lying in the living room and asks, do you have a cat? What kind is it? So uh, how would your character answer? And to kind of give you some examples, I have four characters and uh, and four ways of answering this. And you're going to see if you can match the, the characters to the, uh, to the way they speak. So here we okay. have our characters. Um, we have the crazy cat lady. Um, it's nice to find a picture of somebody who has more cats than I do, although I, it's a drawing, so, you know. <laughs> we'll pretend it's real. It's real. Well, it's me. It's, it's me. Um, okay, and then we, you know, we have a, a kind of a scared-looking, nervous guy. We have the, the ditzy teenage girl and the guy who, I, like, I don't know how to describe him. He's just, he's that guy. You all, Mob you all know when you see him. The yeah. Right, right, that guy. Okay, so here's here's the answers to this question. That's a cat toy? No wonder my dog won't play with it. Like, wow, I knew I should have read the packaging. So who do you think so. said that? Okay, it's got to be the girl in the pink at the bottom in that right. corner with right. that cute hair that I could never pull off if no, I, I tried. No, I know, that Princess Leia awesome hair. Right. Uh, yeah, she's probably on the coolest yeah, yeah she's definitely she's the coolest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you 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 can tell right off that yeah. that's that's a teenager speaking. Okay, hey buddy, are you here to interview me or my cat? On second thought, neither of us feel like talking to you. I'm busy, and my cat hates strangers. I hate to see you get clawed or something. So, okay, yeah, that's a tough that? that's a tough guy that's way tough of guy. saying things. Yeah, that's the right. mob boss with too much jewelry. <laughs> <laughs> yep, tough guy with too much jewelry. 
That's right. That should be in a character bio somewhere. Okay. Um, I don't have a cat. Heaven knows you can't have just one. Cats are like drops of blood. It takes a lot to fill your heart. As far as the toy, well, that's Mr. Wuggles, and he's not a Siamese. Just a plain American short hair, although he would tell you differently. He has delusions of grandeur, I'm afraid. I feel like this is me talking about my <laughs> own two cats, you know? <laughs> yes. There there are moments when I, I become that person. You know, like when you're alone in the house and you're talking to your cat like the cat's going to understand you. Like, right. No. It's That's, not time to eat yet. I don't care what you say. When it's time to go socialize. That's when you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Last one. That's not a cat toy. I uh, have a collection of cat knit mice. Some people collect stamps. I collect mice figurines and uh, mice stuffed animals. What can I say? I just love mice, which is why I don't have a cat. Plus, I'm allergic. I'm really busy. So I'll have to ask you to leave now. Yeah. That's definitely the nervous dude at the bottom. Right. Okay. So, yeah, so you can tell a lot about characterization through the dialogue, and you need to, you know, try for that with your characters. So, okay, number four is to use taglines correctly. And um, this is really something that beginning authors need to know, because if they're not using them correctly, uh, agents and editors usually don't read your whole manuscript to see, you know, if they like the story. They just read until you show them that you haven't learned the craft. Um, my agent, the last time I talked to him, told me he had 600 manuscripts in his uh, inbox. So, oh you know, gosh. obviously, and yeah, and he has to read those on top of everything else he's doing for his existing clients. So, um, yeah, they just read until you either catch them and then they're going to read the whole thing or, um, or until you show them like, nope, I haven't mastered the craft yet. So um, one of the red flags is not using said or asked. Most of the time, I would say 90% of the time, um, you, you're going to use said or asked. And the reason for that is because it's almost like punctuation. Your mind just goes over it. It doesn't draw attention to itself. The other ones, the ones that your English teacher told you you should use, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, those, we all had those English teachers, but the thing to remember is, is that they were never published authors, so they, they right. didn't know what, what editors wanted. Um, yeah, you're, you know, the sparingly disclaimed, interjected, bellowed, promised, repeated news, there's, there's a thousand of them, and you can use them every once in a while, but just not too much, because you have to know that they're, they draw attention to themselves. So sometimes yeah. you're going to want to have that character whisper or, you know, snap or whatever. But most of the time, it's just going to be set. And then you have to resist the urge to spruce up those taglines with adverbs. Um, so just use sparingly the he said firmly, she said smugly, you know, all, all of those. Um, we, we as authors, a lot of times, we just really want to, you know, add, add more words to that sentence, and it's not always necessary. Oh, and I guess I should have said, but people have probably figured out, the tagline is, is uh, what, what tells the reader uh, who's talking. So, okay, so then, and you, you especially don't want to say things like, he snapped impatiently or she shouted loudly um, because they're almost always redundant. Um, of course, he snapped impatiently. Like, right. There's no other way to snap or, you know, of course, you're shouting loudly. Um, no one shouts quietly, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm so, so glad you're going over these because I feel I think that sometimes I feel like even writing, it stops the flow of my writing when I have to worry about saying, um, oh, he said this, da, 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 you know, like trying to explain how he said it um, yes. with these uh, adverbs or with, um, you know, those, uh, those other words that you suggested using. And then you're trying to find new words every single time and going to the right. thesaurus and, and pretty soon you don't even want to do dialogue because it's so exhausting. And really? there's a reason for that. It's because you shouldn't be putting that in there, you know, like yeah. Yeah. that makes yeah. complete and perfect sense. And, and it, as, as a reader, I mean, it can get irritating, you know, to, you know, you, it feels like almost like those, um, what are they called? I want to say Tom Swifties, yeah. where uh, it's a bomb, Tom exploded, you know, or, you know, <laughs> yeah. they, they start to feel a little bit like that. And you, you don't want that in your manuscript. Um, also, okay, and I wish I had learned this. There's some things, you know, you're always learning new things as an author, and then you wish you had learned them um, when you first started writing and not after your 27th book. Right. Um, but I was really <laughs> glad when I, when, I, um, when I learned about not putting the emotion in those taglines. That usually weakens your writing, 
and you want it to be strong. So, okay, so for number five, um, we have this, this little example here. I never want to see your cheating face again, he yelled angrily. You never saw me in the first place, she shouted, her voice full of hate. So, you know, like, technically, there's nothing wrong with this, although I, I, I'd give it, like, you know, a C as far as um, a grade because okay. it's just average. It's not it's So this not would be writing. considered more weak writing, showing that you're a newbie, kind of showing your ignorance when it comes to the fundamentals? Well, right. You just, you, you want to make it as strong as you can, and this is not the way. Oh, and, and by the way, exclamation points. Um, usually you should only use those when your characters are raising their voices. Okay. Um, you don't want to overuse those because that starts to draw the reader's eye too. Um, and you don't ever use them in an internal diet in an internal thought. Um, just in, cause you can't raise your voice in internal thought, in internal, right? Oh, that makes sense. I've never even thought of that before. Now I got to go back through and see if I've actually yeah. done that. I know, and I, I'm actually a little bit afraid to read my first books and see all of the mistakes I made. You That's know? exactly what I was thinking. I was like, yeah. oh, those first two books, I'm frightened. I don't think yeah. I want to go back and check. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. There's, I know, and I also, you know, you give conference talks and stuff, and I always want to tell people, like, don't go check <laughs> my, my books. books. <laughs> Make sure... I, I'm afraid they're going to email me like you broke rule number five on page. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, just, That's hilarious. Just, just learn from us now so you don't have to make those mistakes and worry about Later. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, well, how, how do you make this better? Um, and again, oh, also like the healed angrily. That's a little bit redundant because, you know, yeah, we can tell that. It, you're not going to say that line of dialogue lovingly, right? Um, so, okay. So there's a couple of ways. Oops. Yeah. My, my computer just glitched, but you're looking at Cindy's, so nothing to see there. Okay. Okay. So here we, you can try and put the emotion in the action. That's a better place for it. Um, he ripped her alimony check out of the checkbook and slapped it into her hand. I never want to see your cheating face again. She took the check and folded it first once, then twice, then folded it again, making the paper as small as it could go. You never saw me in the first place. Yeah. Okay, so this, you cannot tell, is, is immediately better than that first example because here we have something to look at. And, and we feel that emotion more when we're seeing it happen than just, you know, if we're being told by exclamation points, right? Right. It's more powerful if the emotion is in the action. That, yeah, right. I can see the difference. Okay, so, and then the next way to put it in is to put it in the, the internal thought, the point of view. So here's an example of that. He ripped her alimony check out of the checkbook with numb hands. He'd written checks thousands of times without even thinking about it. For piano lessons, Girl Scout cookies, every elementary school fundraiser that came along. This time it felt as though the ink had come right out of his heart. He put the paper into her outstretched hands. I never want to see your cheating face again. She took the check and folded it once, then twice, then over again, making the paper as small as it could go. You never saw me in the first place. Okay, so this also, you know, is, is more powerful than that first example. Um, you really, you feel for him, right? You, you, mm -hmm. you, you feel that emotion with him instead of just being told that he's angry. Um, and then when, when you're putting um, you, uh, in any internal thought or any point of view, the rule is, is that you, you stay with the same character throughout the scene. You don't want to head hop, you know. I right. so I didn't I didn't then tell you what she was thinking because that would have been a point of view violation, and that will also get you rejected quickly out of the um, out of the slush pile. So yeah. you, you don't want to make that mistake. And um, that was one of my first mistakes, actually, when I first oh, started to learn. Right. That was like the first one that I learned because I was head hopping so much, and that was mm -hmm. that. And you know, it, that's nothing you ever learn in English class. Right. I never learned. I never would have known that if I hadn't joined a writing group. So, yeah. 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 That, isn't that funny? Like in the English class, you're going to learn about the symbolism in Grapes of Wrath, right? Yes. But you're not <laughs> going to actually learn how, how to, to write a novel. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. You're on your own for that. Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah. And it is, you know, I think that's the first mistake that everybody makes. You know, that the whole, I did the same thing. That was the first thing in a writer's group that I was told was like, no, you, you can't jump around in people's heads. Mm -hmm. So it was very disappointing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but a lot of rewriting to do after that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. It's all rewriting. 
Okay, so, um, all right, so as that example showed, that kind of segues into rule number six, is that your dialogue will be smoother if you use action and point of view to designate who is talking. So you are going to be using said quite a bit, but when you can get away with just using action or internal thought to, to tell the reader who's um, who's speaking, that's even better. So here's an example of this from one of my books, uh, My Fair Godmother, and uh, this is a series about poor hapless girls who all get this incompetent fairy godmother. Um, and this scene, she she's it's, she's about to meet the fairy godmother, and she meets first his the leprechaun assistant, and she's a little bit shocked about this. So here it is. Um, okay, having computer problems again. Um, okay, okay, just a second. All right, that's okay. My hands. My hands went to my mouth, and I had to stifle the urge to scream. Instead, I let out quick breaths. I'm having a nervous breakdown, aren't I? He put his hands behind his back and looked up at me. I'm not qualified to comment on your mental health. I'm a leprechaun, not a doctor. I wish I could do this with an Irish accent. I'm sorry. I can't, <laughs> I can't no help with, you either. <laughs> I know. Sorry. Somebody, okay, somebody who has an Irish accent, please call in. And That's right. Over, the right? voiceover. <laughs> yes. Now on with our business. Where is your Miss High and Mighty Godmother? What, I asked. Chrysanthemum Everstar. He scanned the room. She's here, isn't she? I shook my head. I don't know what you're talking about. He did a full turn on, on my bed and then went out a hump. I, it's just like her me. She had to take her own advice every once in a while, and that's the truth. He shot me a dissatisfied look. And I know what you're thinking, seeing a leprechaun and all, but you can't have me gold, so don't even ask. That's not what I've been thinking. I was wondering how long nervous breakdowns lasted and what else was going to pop up in my bedroom. I took a step closer to him. Did I understand you right? Are you meeting someone in my bedroom? Okay, so if you were reading along with me and paying attention, you'll notice that there is only one, um, you know, asked in this whole thing and there's not even a said. And really, I didn't even need to put that one in because there's only two characters. So the readers would have known um, that it was her, was yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I just put that in there because I liked that. I wanted a little bit extra beat, you know, a little bit of a longer right. pause before the next line of dialogue. Which so. is an interesting thing to mention just as far as pacing and beat goes, mm -hmm. you know, just that, that it is kind of rhythmic sometimes. You know, language, language yeah. is rhythmic and writing is rhythmic. Right, and, and you do need to pay attention to that. I, I don't feel like it's a personal strength of mine. But, um, you know, writers are told to read stuff out loud, and it really does make a difference. You know, when you're reading something you out loud, you do pick up a lot of those sort of problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, so which um, brings us, that's a good segue into this next rule, is to vary where you put the taglines. Because that helps with the, the rhythm, right? Right. Um, if you're putting them all at the beginning or all at the end, it, it just starts to feel wrong. So um, so here's an example of a be um, end, beginning, and middle. Um, this is the worst party, she said. Or she shook her head. This is the worst party. Or this is the worst party, she said, and I can't believe I'm throwing it. So um, any any of those work, and you um, you probably just want to vary them. And again, this is something doing, doing revisions. Um, I do very little trying to make taglines beautiful or interesting or anything on that first draft. That's okay. always comes later. So you definitely recommend, well, and I've recommended this too, like, because when you're editing in your head while you're writing, it just stops the flow. It just, yeah. and, and causes writer's block because you just can't get out of your editor brain. Yeah. Yeah. That is so true. So, and it's always for me, um, because, you know, I'll write something and then I'll spend, say, maybe three months revising it. Mm -hmm. And then when it's time to write the next thing, it is always so hard because you've been in that editing right. mode yeah. for yeah. so long. It's hard to, to flip over, at least for me. Okay, anyway, num number eight. Okay, so the rule of thumb is that in a scene between two people, every four lines of dialogue, you need a tagline. Um, so even when there are two people, the reader will lose track uh, sometimes of who's speaking. So you want to remind them about every fourth line. It could be even more if the di dialogue is long. Mm -hmm. um, and then it, in the, if you have a scene that has more than two people in it, then you need a tagline every time somebody speaks. 
And in my Slayer series, there's a group of like eight kids and there are hardly ever just two people in a scene in, the, in those books. And I don't know that I will ever write <laughs> scenes <laughs> with that many people again because it does become hard. That's you can only hard get one, to juggle them. Yeah, you can only give one character an internal thought, which means everybody else, you either have to use a said or an action. And, you know, yeah, it just gets to be a little bit hard. So, hard to juggle okay. all of them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so number nine is um, characters shouldn't always say what they're thinking. Every once in a while, I, um, I'll i read a book where, like, the characters just, uh, and maybe the author is using it as, you know, kind of an ex expose on their characters mm -hmm. but like they'll say all these personal intimate details about their lives to near strangers um and it just it just feels a little bit unnatural uh, mm -hmm. and again that's where internal thought is your friend and you, you should be having your characters think about things that they're not necessarily saying so okay so here's an example uh, of how i did this in the first slayers book and it's uh, Slayers is about um, teenagers who have superpowers to fight dragons, which are coming back, and they're not the nice dragons that want to be your friend. They're dragons that want to eat you. Um, <laughs> yeah, so she, Tori goes to this, this camp where uh, it's for these kids that have these superpowers, and they're trained to fight dragons. And she is a dragon slayer, but at the time when she first enrolls, she doesn't realize that she is. So Jesse, one of the uh, guys from camp is showing her around and and it's all of this sort of extreme training that's really over the top um, and the, he's just shown her the Easter grounds where they do some of this um, extreme training and they run up there at night after dark so um, this is what he tells her this is the Easter grounds Jesse said walking his horse around the stone circle it's a straight shot so you can't get lost even in the dark Tori nodded, not sure why he'd given her this information. We come up here in the dark, he said, when we go running at night. You don't use a lighted path? There's enough light to see. Oh, she imagined everyone running with their flashlights jiggling out in front of them. Now that you've, now that, now you've seen it, so you'll have a mental picture of it when we run up here tonight. Tori looked around the clearing and the uneven path that led to it. Yep, she had a mental picture. She had a mental picture of herself sitting on her bed, going through text messages instead of running. <laughs> That's so, so snarky. Uh, I love it. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's, um, yeah, it's a good way to to put in characterization. And again, you can see that there's there's not a lot of seds in here. Right. right. Like maybe there's one. So, alrighty. Okay. So rule number ten, 10 is to keep it short. Don't let your characters deliver speeches. Uh, there's really very few times in life where one person just, you know, talks on and on and on without interruption. So it doesn't feel natural. But also, um, if you've ever looked at a at a book and there was huge, big blocks of paragraphs, um, it, it doesn't look inviting to the reader. So you want to, you know, break up those speeches anyway with some white space. But um, the other, I probably the most important reason why you don't want to go really very long and sometimes you need to have a character tell the secret or the you know reveal who who killed the victim or you know sometimes that there has to be a speech but, um there's my guard guard dog it's okay my dog was barking before too so no worries stop it puppy so this is a like you can't break into my house i've got vicious guard dogs like just in case <laughs> you're wondering don't try it don't try it <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Anyway, where were we? Okay. So, okay. So the most important reason why you don't want to have big blocks of speeches is that the reader will start to wonder, okay, what, what are the reactions of the people are, who are hearing this speech? Okay. Um, are they rolling their eyes? Are they inching out the door? Are they worried, uh -huh. stunned, whatever? So you're going to want to cut to them and show their, their reactions. Um, maybe you know, break it up with some questions, things like that. Okay. And that's going to bring people into the scene more too, I would think. That's going to make it a lot more immediate for them. Yes, definitely. Okay. Um, so number 11 is have your dialogue match your pacing. Um, and well, you know, and it's different for different genres, first off, like, so romances, um, you'll, you'll tend to use longer sentences in a romance, more descriptive, um, and in action, especially if it's men's action, you're going to use more 
you know, short clip sentences. Uh, but you need to also match that to what's happening in your story. Um, for example, if, if your character is really angry or afraid, they're not going to be using, you know, like really long sentences. Mm -hmm. If you've ever been really angry, um, which if you're a parent, you've been really angry. Yes. Um, <laughs> I've been there. Um, yeah. You, if you think about it, when you're really angry, it's hard to get words out at all, mm -hmm. right? So you are not giving darling little junior um, a really long lecture about why it's wrong to flush things down the toilet. You know, you're, <laughs> you know, go through your room, right? Uh -huh. um, so remember that while you're, um, while you're writing. So this is an example of um, my, from my book, Son of War, Daughter of Chaos. And this is also about teenagers who have some, they have Egyptian superpowers. No, no dragons in this one. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So this is a scene where Tori, the main character, finds out that her boyfriend isn't who she thought he was. And he is at her house. Um, and she has locked herself in her father's room and has him on the phone. Um, and, okay, let's go to this. If my computer will work. Okay. I blinked, leaning closer to the window to see where he'd gone. Only the empty yard lay in front of me. A thunk sounded on the roof above me. Then footsteps hurried across. Either Dane was taking a shortcut to his car or he was finding a better tactical position up there. He's on the roof, I told my father. He said he was bringing back friends. I peered at the yard again as though they might materialize. He said Rourke is a murderer. I'm nearly to our neighborhood. Why does he think Rourke is a murderer? Because Dane is one of our enemies. That doesn't make sense. Okay, so if you look at this, um, you know, I don't, I think I have one sort of long, but not, I mean, none really, mm -hmm. really long. Um, and, and then when they're talking, it goes to their, you know, pretty short sentences because, uh, She's worried, and also that speeds up the pace. Mm -hmm. And in those tense moments, you know, the pace should be really fast. Okay. Um, number 12 is to avoid slang, pop references, spelling words wrong to create accents and profanity. And the reason why you want the first two is that um, slang and pop references will date your book, and you don't want that. You want people to still be able to read it um, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, um, and you know, I have been, I've learned the hard way not to use celebrities in, um, in my books. Uh, for example, I, in Revenge of the Cheerleaders, uh, I had characters, they were trying out for sort of like an American Idol, you know, voice sort uh -huh. of thing. And um, one of them, they were singing a song and one was worried because they hadn't written it. And I wrote the, this line of dialogue. Uh, you don't think Britney Spears got where she is today by writing her own songs. And at the time, you know, uh, yeah, uh, you, you can tell what's coming. Yeah. Um, at the time, um, she was like the biggest pop star there was. And I thought she has staying power. People will know who she is, you know, years from now. This right. Well, publishing is a slow industry, and it's about a year from the time you turn in your book to the time it comes out. And when that book came out, Britney Spears um, had just shaved off all of her hair and was being carted off to a mental, you know, institution. Oh, so suddenly, it. that that um, that sentence had a completely different meaning that yeah. I had not intended. It went from positive yeah. to to negative or to sarcastic yeah. real fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you can. I I have too many stories like that to tell, which is why now I just make up my celebrities <laughs> and don't use real ones because. They will do crazy things on you. Yes. Um, so the, the spelling words wrong to create accents, and I know your English teacher praised Mark Twain for this and made you read his stuff, um, but the thing to remember is that um, Mark Twain, you know, would not be published that way mm -hmm. um, to, in today's market. Right. Um, I'm sure he would be published. He would just be writing differently. Um, and the reason why they don't like that now is um, is – well, you know, I guess it, it could be seen as insulting for one thing, but right. for the, another, um, it's it, it slows down the reader. Every time you have some weird spelling, it, the reader they're going to stop for you know just a second. To have, they have to sound out that word to figure out what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So after a while, it does become annoying and tiring. And um, yeah, which is why I suggest if you're listening to a Mark Twain book, do it on Audible, right? So you don't have to read it. Um, 
Well, and I remember and the, dealing with that problem too in in high school when I was reading it because it slowed uh-huh. me down to have to yeah to try and figure. Oh, that's what he meant. That's what you know. Like it was yes. phonetically, he was writing it all phonetically right. instead of you know the way that I know words should be spelled. So yeah, it what it did pull me out a little bit of it. It, it, yeah. it was really hard. Yes. Yes. Okay. And so the the last one is profanity, and um, and I say. Th- I think this is especially true if you're writing for um, for young adults, mm-hmm. but it can be true even for adults. Uh, I I decided not to have swear words in my books, and I cannot tell you how many uh, emails I've gotten from people that have said thank you for not swearing in your books. I have had no one um, email me and say I really liked your book, but it could have used more <laughs> swear words. Um, so 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 when you're whenever you put in profanity. Um, then you're you're narrowing your markets, I mean, and, and especially with kids, you want your your books to be in this their school libraries, in their classroom libraries, um, and so yeah, I just tell people don't narrow your market. Um, of course, there are you know I just the last novella that I wrote, um, I it's a, it's for adults and it's a romance about a girl and she meets this guy who's an undercover cop, um, and so they're with gangsters for for part of this time and it did become a hard thing to just go okay um Mm -hmm. these people would be swearing and actually these people would be swearing maybe every Every, sentence yeah every (laughs) sentence every other word yeah how do i get around this because i knew what you know it's been you know i've been writing for 22 years or published for 22 years so at this point i have expectations um so yeah that became kind of a challenge and i probably won't write you know those sorts of characters again because it was just too hard but but even then um you know you can just say he let out a stream of curses or you know right and then, then do the, so i think right. that's a good way uh, to get around it then yeah yeah so they, yeah as i said no one will ever write you and say need more swearing <laughs> um <laughs> okay so here's my bonus tip and this works for everything that you want to learn in in writing is to just read, read, and read some more. Writers should always be reading something. Um, I feel it helps so much um, to read both stuff that's really good and stuff that's really bad. Uh, it's it, By reading the stuff that's really bad, that kind of teaches you like, oh, and this is why we show, not tell, or this is why we don't do info dumps, or because, you know, that bad stuff sticks out to you once, once you're looking for it. Um, and, and, and I think the really, I don't know that there's a better way to teach people pacing except for to read. I don't know whether you can learn that any other way. So mm-hmm. always be reading. Mm-hmm. No, I think you're right. I think that most people have a really, have really good instincts when it comes to pacing uh, just because of the fact that they'll put the book down even though they don't necessarily know why they did. It just, yeah. for whatever reason, that book was off to them. And a lot of times it is, it is the pacing. It feels right. And we come to expect certain things from mm-hmm. books that should be working a certain way. And if they don't, then we put it down. So you're right. right. Reading, even or, reading or things. You just, don't, you just don't like it. It's it's interesting yeah. as a writer to, to go to my book club because, um, you know, I'll, I'll read a book and have a completely different viewpoint on it than the other people. And it's always interesting to hear the things that they talk about and things that they like and, and they didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, the things that stuck out to them were, you know, because they're not reading it looking for technical things. And I, I, you know, as a writer, you, you know, you kind of always do whether you want to or not. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, that's how true. Did they, <laughs> how did they start that? What was their first sentence? You know, things like that. So, um, oh, and I also wanted to um, mention if you're writing YA dialogue, um, some editors uh, want dialogue only with the vocabulary they think the average teen would use. I had one editor that was always... Um, you know, flagging my my dialogue. You know, would would a teen say that she relished you know his kiss or something like that? And mm-hmm. yeah, and so I'm at school visits, so it seemed like I had a list of words that I'm. Would you use this word? Would you use that word? You know, <laughs> after yeah, stealth stealthy was one of them that, that my editor didn't think a really a boy would know what stealthy was. You're so kidding. yeah, I asked them stealthy. About the Gosh, yeah. how many of you know what stealthy is? They did know it. I was glad. Maybe it's I don't, might be in the um, you know the computer games. <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> computer game work. Thank goodness. Anyway, uh, 
yeah, so some some editors, uh, you know, and you do want your, again, you want your, your characters to sound like teenagers. I read a book once and it actually like made me laugh out loud. It was a published book. And the main character was this rebellious boy band teenager guy who I think had dropped out of school. And he had this line of dialogue. In truth, I've always had a passion for music. And I just thought like, ah, oh, no. No, not, not in truth. <laughs> yeah, no 16-year-old guy is going to start a sentence with in truth. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're right. Well, at, least, well, at, least, at least not the character she had done. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so, I mean, yes, the, you do need to make them sound like teenagers. But some editors believe, and I think rightly so, that teens learn vocabulary when they read. Like, that's one of the, the benefits of reading. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, yeah, if you have a kid who li- loves to read, they don't have to study for the ACT vocabulary or the SAT vocabulary. They're, they'll nail it because mm-hmm. they read, and those words are there. So um, other authors are like, you can use whatever big four syllable words you want to. And and that's awesome too. Okay, so um, then I just have uh, a couple exercises that I usually do um, and people here can, can try them too. Um, one of them is to write a few paragraphs where your main characters are fighting about something using the dialogue rule. So you just write, you know, write that fight scene, you know, something with some good conflict and then go back and can you know, compare it to the rules and, and see, like, how did you use those taglines? Um, you know, were the characters telling stuff that they already knew? And actually, that's maybe the one time you can get away with it mm-hmm. a little bit is, you know, when you're fighting, you are going to bring up those things. You missed Valentine's Day last right. year. <laughs> or, you know, whatever, because you're saying it as an accusation. But, right. Um, yes. But, but normally you wouldn't. Okay, so, and then the second one is to write some dialogue from one of your scenes using only action and internal thought, you know, point of view to designate who's speaking and try and not use any of those sets or, you know, um, and you know, see if, if you can do it. Um, you know, I always, I think whenever we can put in visuals or internal thought, it, it makes it better. Mm-hmm. And I think this is great for editing. Just when you go back through your manuscript, I think these are great editing exercises as you go through and you think, okay, I'm just going to focus on taglines and whether or not I'm actually putting emotion into these actions and getting it across that way or in point of view. And just edit your book through that perspective and focus on that thing, which is probably why it takes so long to edit books. But it's a good idea, you know, focusing on just one aspect of of editing and going through and looking at that. I think it'd be a great exercise for the entire book, which I seriously want to do with all of my books now, just because, you know, now that now that we're talking about this. So, yeah, definitely. And oh, I I should make a new slide for this because I just thought one of the things again, because it takes so long to. To, to edit and when you're checking all of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the things that I do check is how many times do I have my characters shake their head? Yeah. Or, oh, or, yeah. Or, or sigh. I, I, yeah. I have, you know, my characters do a lot of that. And, and some of it you can get away with, you know. Um, you know, you can smile many times during a novel and readers are not going to um, catch that. But, you know, if you always are having your characters shake their head or nod or sigh, then, then those things start to become too repetitive. So, yeah, it's sometimes I will, you know, purposely give my character something to do. They're, you know, they're eating or they're, you know, okay. just so that you can have them do some action for those taglines. Okay. That makes so much sense. Oh, thank you, Jeanette, so much for giving us the the writing great dialogue (laughs) rules Uh, I'm so grateful to you for that uh, especially because of our earlier technical difficulties but uh, so I'm really glad that this has worked out and we were able to get together and do this and I wanted you to talk a little bit about the YouTube video that you shared with our the YouTube channel that you have because I actually did go and check it out and subscribe to it and I watched one of them Mm -hmm. and it's so cool and your introduction video just when you get on your actual YouTube page it's Mm -hmm. so funny like that 50 (laughs) second That's great. It's so fun. But this idea that you have is so interesting, and I learned so much. So tell us about it. 
Well, my writers group, I, you know, we were together and just talking about doing some critiques and thought it would be fun to do a YouTube show where, you know, like American Idol, um, people send us their first page and we read it and one person is the narrator and the other have uh buzzers in front of them and we act like we're agents or editors and when we see that first problem or where we would stop reading um we hit the buzzer and then we tell them why you know sometimes it could be like that's a really low tension first sentence or this was confusing dialogue. We didn't know who was speaking or, you know, just there's so many things. But mm-hmm. those first pages are so important. And um, in, so, in so many ways, they're hard because that first page, you need to hook the reader. You need to give them a sense of what genre it is. You need to, you know, give some information about the character and the setting. And, and it can be hard to do. So, um, yeah, and, and it's just fun. You know, we, we goof around and you know, mm-hmm. I think, I think writers, we, that's, we have fun with each other. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's one of the benefits of being a writer is you get to be silly with other writers. I think we just get each other's crazy, you know, like yeah. we, we get, yeah, we get that. And it's it. important to be around someone who gets your crazy. Right. So people, you, you make up worlds and people too. <laughs> that's right. I tell people that all the time. They're like, what do you do for a living? And I say, well, I write lies and I sell them on Amazon. <laughs> so, exactly. I, I write stories about fantastical places and people. And then, you know, you've got those things in your brain all the time. And people yeah. look at you and think that you've got, you know, you're thinking about deep thoughts and really you're just trying to figure out how you're going to tie one plot line into another plot line. Yes. And, fill in a plot hole and they just never the crazy chaotic musings of an author you know so yeah so and I I wonder I I sit there and I think what do normal people think about you know (laughs) during the choir concert you know (laughs) two hours of questionably singing you know and what is everybody else thinking about because I'm (laughs) I'm running through scenes in my mind (laughs) this is background music oh my gosh my husband will be driving sometimes and I'm thinking about like the next scene that I need to write and mm-hmm. I don't realize that he's told me something and he'll have to touch <laughs> yes. me and say, where, what, where are you mentally? I just need to know. Are you listening? Did you get that? I just said something important and I need to know that, that <laughs> that's it there. Yes. So my poor, yes. yeah, he knows, he knows the crazy train is here to stay. <laughs> yep. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, Jeanette, thank you so much for coming. Sure. Um, oh, tell us the name. Uh, did you tell us the name of the oh, YouTube channel? Oh, no, I never. I never okay, tell the us the name. There's three hours to guess that. <laughs> um, it's uh, called, it's the, the Ready, Set, Write is, is the group. We also do a podcast. And it's called So You Think You Can Write. So if you type in Ready, Set, Write, So You Think You Can Write, um, then the channel will come up and it's it's just fun but it's also hopefully p- people will learn things well I learned something and it and it well and it's something it reminded me of it it was one of the mm-hmm. ones where that you read um, I think it was episode 11 but it mm-hmm. talked about they they didn't like the references to pop culture the vampire oh. stuff that you know mm-hmm. they didn't like that I liked it it didn't take me out of it just like you didn't have a problem with mm-hmm. it but I understood why they said take that first paragraph out and just put the other yeah. one up to the front you know because you do want to make that opening scene more immediate and it's just action mm-hmm. right then and there so I thought that was super helpful and I think that channel is going to help so many people because when it comes to writing uh, you really don't know until you write and apply you know, what you're learning. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. you don't know until you get critiqued. And I think that's half the battle for a lot of people is that they want to write, but they're so scared to be critiqued. Um, yes. And they've got to get past that fear and recognize that it's not personal. It's a process of getting you yeah. better. It's the only way you can right. learn. It's the best way to learn. Right. So I think that right. if people can go to this show and watch other papers getting critiqued and, you know, you guys have that, the dialogue rolling up in the background, which is so helpful because they can mm-hmm. read it with you, you know. Um, mm-hmm. that, that's really helpful because then they can see what the author's written. They can hear what you guys are saying and why this doesn't work. And, and, and then they can think about their own manuscript. And maybe they've mm-hmm. done something similar. And they're like, oh, I can fix that. I can change that. So I think it's yeah. just super helpful. And it's a fun atmosphere and environment so I'm gonna go back through and watch all of them and I really okay. I hope everyone will I hope everyone who's watching this will go find you guys because it looks awesome okay oh. 
Well, it's a lot of fun. So thank you. And I hope people like it. Me too. Okay. Well, thank you again Mm -hmm. for being here. I'm going to put links to your books and to your YouTube channel. And also I'm going to put a link to this um, PDF uh, uh, thing that you gave us thing because I can't think of the word even though I should because I'm an author <laughs> so that people can download the PowerPoint presentation if they need to you know they can have that reference in this um, but you guys if you liked this uh, video and you found it helpful which I, I know you will please like like this video please subscribe if you're new to the family go check out Jeanette's books because she's awesome sauce and wonderful and just a very accomplished USA Today bestseller um and uh and we will see you guys all in the next video thank you so much Jeanette all right thank you bye-bye okay and we are done